Welcome back. I hope you had a chance to have a cup of tea and they all set for the last part of the lecture. We're going to start by looking at some really clever ways in which technology can be used to deliver insulin. The first one is insulin pumps. I think you might imagine that if you are injecting insulin on a daily basis, multiple times per day, so you've got the bolus and basal insulin, so you've got multiple injections there, that's going to become a bit wearing. And so the idea of an insulin pump is that it's constantly full of an insulin solution and it can automatically add insulin into your bloodstream in response to whatever you're doing. They can be programmed to replicate endogenous background insulin. So that's the basal injections we looked at earlier. Uh, they can pr be programmed to vary between night and day because you're not eating during the night. Well, unless you're going for secret midnight snacks or something like that. And they can also be set to deliver bolus injections at specific times, okay, in response to food. But you would normally, you'd need to tell the system, okay, I've just eaten something. And so the system then pumps more insulin um, into you. It only uses fast acting insulin. And I think that should come as no surprise. The last thing that you want is a pump which is designed to control your blood glucose level using a long acting insulin. It would be like trying to turn a cruise liner. You've got to decide several miles in advance that you want to turn a corner. You don't want um, a pump to be pumping in long acting insulin. You, you've eaten glucose and you need to deal with it now. You don't need your insulin levels to rise in three hours time when you haven't eaten. So the systems are using fast acting insulins only. There are a number of types of systems, we'll look at them on the next screen, but they all contain the same basic components, which are a pump, a reservoir, tubing, a cannula, and a control device. If you put um, all of those things together in one box, and, and you don't actually directly attach that box to the patient, then those are called tethered pump systems, shown on the left on the screen. You have a cannula, which is allowing um, direct injection into your bloodstream. Everything else is in a separate box. You can carry that box around with you, but it's not actually directly um, adhered to your body in any way. Alternatively, you can have the, the pump, the reservoir of insulin uh, and the cannula and the driving motor directly attached to your body. And then you have a computer system which is separate from your body to control when the um, when the pump activates. That's called a patch pump. So the patient actually wears a patch directly and then there's some software to control uh, the motor. Okay, those are the two basic um, systems. On the screen is a system shown, um, Omnipod Dash. It's, um, it's one of the latest systems which is available for um, managing um, diabetes. It's called a Personal Diabetes Management System or um, PDM. So the pod attaches to the body, uh, so it's a patch pump, uh, and the user inputs blood glucose readings into the software. And the software then decides how much insulin to inject into the body. Kind of important here to remember that the patient is still having to take fingerprint uh, pricks in order to work out their own blood glucose level. And they've got to enter that information into that system in order to get it to function properly. What you really want is something like an artificial pancreas. That's shown on the screen in front of you. Artificial pancreases, if that's the plural of pancreas, are aimed at type 1 diabetics, really, because they need long-term um, replacement of a pancreas, essentially, don't they? And in that system, it's essentially a patch pump, but the software is using artificial intelligence and is measuring blood glucose levels directly in order to work out autonomously when to inject insulin. Okay, so it's essentially a patch pump uh, combined with a glucose monitor, and the software is then taking both of those readings at the same time. Oh, sorry, both readings. It's taking the um, blood glucose readings, and it's automatically directing the pump to add insulin as necessary using um, AI to, to work out what you've done. So if it sees a rapid rise in glucose, for instance, it knows you've just eaten a pizza or something like that, and it responds appropriately. Okay, Those systems are not yet on the market um, commercially available, but they are in development. So maybe within a year or two, those systems will start to become um, available. We're going to finish with one of my favourite topics. It, it's one of my favourite topics because I teach dry powder inhalers uh, quite a lot. 
And so um, one of the things we always say for inhalable products is they tend to be the holy grail of, um, of pharmaceutical design. Apparently, everyone loves the idea of breathing in a product rather than trying to swallow a tablet or a capsule. Not totally sure that's true, but when the only formulation that's available is an injection, as it is for insulin, I think it probably is fair to say that most patients would prefer to inhale insulin than inject it. And so the idea of developing an inhalable form of insulin was for a long time the holy grail of pharmaceutics. And I've been to many, many research lectures over the years where, where people use that term and they say, these are the reasons why uh, we think um, patients would want to in, um, inhale insulin. And um, you probably know this because you do the pulmonary route elsewhere, but the lung is a really good target for drug therapy for multiple reasons. The, the most common one is because it's got a massive surface area. And so you've got this huge potential for absorption simply because you have this large surface area. There's no first pass effect as there is from the gut because the blood is not emptying directly into the liver. It says good patient compliance. I'm not sure that's true when there's an oral form of a tablet, but it certainly is true, I think, for um, for in an injectable. If you gave a patient the choice, do you want to inject something or do you want to inhale it? They're probably going to choose an inhaler. So, so it certainly has good patient compliance. But I've written at the bottom of the screen, inhalable insulin has certainly not been a commercial success. OK, now I don't know if you know, if I were to ask you how many inhalable insulins are on the market at the moment. Do you know? I'll give you a clue. It's a number between zero and one, if that helps. That, that's, that sounds like a binary instruction, doesn't it? The answer is one. There's one on the market at the moment. If I said to you, how many inhalable insulins have been developed and launched onto the market? Would you know? I'm going to give you another clue, actually. It's the number between zero and two. That's a bit of a leading question, isn't it? So the answer is uh, two. That's right. There are two um, products that have been launched onto the market and only one is still going. So right there, if someone says to you, um, is insulin, um, inhalable insulin, commercially successful? You can say, well, two products have been launched and only one is still going. So on that basis, no, it's a good, good answer, isn't it? The two products are Exubera and Afriza. Exubera is shown on the screen in front of you. It's a Pfizer product and it was the first inhaled insulin launched onto the market. It was actually developed by... Um, uh, Sanofi Aventis, but it was bought by Pfizer. So Pfizer is a really large company and sometimes they go around and they see what other people are developing and they think well, that's good. And so they offer them a really huge amount of money and buy it, thinking the product's going to be a massive commercial success. And in the main, Pfizer's right. They are massive commercial successes, which is why Pfizer's got so much money. But in this instance, it was not a massive commercial success. They bought this product from Sanofi Aventis for 1.2 billion US dollars. And they estimated that year on year sales would be around two billion US dollars per year. That's pretty good money, isn't it? Because it means within seven months, you've got your investment back again. And after that, it's pure profit, isn't it? However, they withdrew that product from the market after sales of just 12 million US dollars in the first nine months. 12 million compared with expected revenues of two billion. That's a massive difference. OK, 12 million, although it's a lot to you and me. Might not be a lot to you, but it's a, it is to me, okay? Lecture salary. Um, is nowhere near $2 billion, okay? So Pfizer decided after about 18 months to withdraw that product from the market. And it, that decision alone to withdraw this product from the market cost them nearly $3 billion US dollars. And it also led them to close the third largest site that they had in the world. It, it nearly led to the closure of the um, sandwich site, actually. And so it's, uh, it was a really big commercial failure. I said some coursework about this in the MSc programme, actually. And the question is, is Exubera a commercial success or not? And I have to be honest, the majority of students do actually read up about Exubera and they realise it's not a massive commercial success. But I do remember one student who completely didn't read about it at all. And he started his essay with Exubera was a massive commercial success for Pfizer. And I thought, well, you clearly haven't read anything about this because it was a, a massive um, failure. Why was it a massive failure? I don't hear you ask. And the answer is because... It's a product that was developed by scientists. One of the reasons that I like using it as an example in teaching is because it's a classic case where a, a scientist has thought to themselves, right, what's the issue here? We have to get insulin in some sort of inhalable aerosol and we have to get patients to breathe it in and we have to mimic the same sort of blood 
insulin levels as we would get with injection. And so they developed this product and it does all of those things beautifully. It really is a beautifully performing product from a scientist's point of view. No, none of the scientists involved in the development of this product ever asked a patient, what do you think about taking this product? None of them. So there are a number of reasons why it failed. We're not going to go into it in massive detail. I'll just go for the main ones. But one of the really big problems, and big, uh, every pun intended, is, be is because of the size of the device. Um, there, are, there is a photograph of it shown on the screen in front of you, and it, you might not get an idea for quite how big it is, but I happen to have my very retro 70s flask here. It's about the same size as this uh, Thermos flask. Okay. Now, can you imagine if you're using a small dry powder inhaler, they're about this big, and you're using it in public, then you can do that quite discreetly, can't you? You could get the device out of the bag, maybe you could put your hand in front of your mouth, you could bring the device up, put it away, and it's done. In this particular instance, the device was so big for a very specific reason, and that is that they had the insulin in a, in a spray-dried powder, and you need to aerosolize that insulin. And the way that works in a dry powder inhaler is the patient, when they breathe in, it's the airflow that they generate by breathing in is what aerosolizes the powder. OK, so you do this and that air that you suck in is what aerosolizes the powder in the device. In this instance, the powder was really hard to aerosolize. So what the scientists did was they created a pump. And the idea of using the product is you start with the product and you started to use the pump to pressurize the air inside a chamber. And you need quite a high pressure because it was a difficult to aerosolize powder, much harder to aerosolize than, than um, well, it was, it was not possible to aerosolize it with, by breathing in. So this airflow that you, you would create by breathing in wasn't strong enough to aerosolize this powder. So you had to create this high air pressure to aerosolize the powder in the first place. And the other thing that had to happen is when you released, um, the air to aerosolize the powder, it took a while for that powder to disperse properly. And so in order to give the device room to aerosolize properly, they created a big spacer. So you had the device at the end, which you could pump up with this pump. Plus you had this glass spacer. I realized that it's, this is a thermal flask. Okay. But the size is about this, but it was made of clear plastic about this size. Okay. Can you imagine therefore that you're in a restaurant? a very posh restaurant with some very posh people around and you need to take insulin because you're about to eat this very expensive pizza that you're about to buy. You're then going to start doing this with this ginormous great device and it looked a lot like a bong. Okay. And so patients didn't use it in public because it looked like they were trying to smoke cannabis or something like that. And it really, it really stopped them being able to use the device outside. So that's one problem right there. No one asked a patient, would you use a device? the size of this thermos flask to take insulin. Because if they'd bothered to ask them, the patients would have said no. So that was one issue right there. Another one I did mention earlier is that for some inexplicable reason, the product was developed in unit doses of milligrams, not international units per mil. Probably because it doesn't contain a solution, does it? It contains a powder. And so you can't really give it IU per mil, but you could have given it IU per gram, something which was easy for the patient to understand. So you've got some patients that are using pens or injections, and then you're asking them to go to their doctor and try and get this inhalable version. But now they need to be able to convert from IU per mil to milligrams. So that was a problem right there. A number of patients said the product doesn't work or they don't get good control of blood glucose. And that's because they did the conversion wrong. So the amount that they were inhaling from the device was the wrong amount because they'd done the conversion wrong. So there was a whole range of issues um, which really didn't help. And I think if the Pfizer scientists had actually talked to patient groups before they developed and launched this product, it would have been fine. But they didn't. And so Pfizer withdrew that from the market. And it's kind of a massive disaster, actually. So we're not going to go into the into it in great detail, but I just thought it's an interesting point to note that in this instance, the scientists developed a great product which works really well, but they simply didn't ask the users, would you actually use this product? And it's kind of important for all of you pharmaceutical scientists out there. The last product, and it is still on the market today, is a freezer. Now, I know what you're saying. I've got a freezer. It's in my kitchen. It's where I keep my chips. I, I agree with you, but it's not that sort of freezer. Okay. I don't know why they called it a freezer either. It's a bit silly, isn't it? But 
In my mind, whenever I say this, a freezer, all I can think of is a Zanussi freezer. It's not good. So um, try not to do that. Just just think of yourself a freezer. When, when someone says to you, there's a freezer, don't, don't look and expect to see something which they're keeping food. Think to yourself, oh, that's an inhalable form of insulin. It should be good. Yeah. So a freezer is shown on the screen in front of you um, with a hand. So you can, you can gauge its um, size. It's a lot smaller than uh, Exubera. And that was really important because... Patients didn't want to use such a massive product in public, did they? So this is much more discreet and it's about the same size as a conventional dry powder inhaler. It's a lot better. It's a mankind product and it's marketed by um, Sanofi. Although I believe I read the other day that Sanofi has pulled out of that agreement. So it no longer markets this product. I think it's gone back to mankind. And so they market it on their own at the moment. I think that is also a reflection that you might read into the commercial success or the commercial market for inhalable insulins. It's not quite as large as people think it is. But nonetheless, this product is still on the market. And so it is um, it is still effective. Uh, it's very similar to, um, to um, uh, Exubera in the way that it, it is uh, containing the insulin in um, powder particles that you can inhale. It's much easier to aerosolize by in, inhale uh, breath like any other dry powder inhaler. It takes about a minute for the insulin from um, breathing in to get into the blood, which is pretty good. And you would take it immediately before eating. So no need to inject. You just wait for your food to arrive in the restaurant. In you go and, and you're away. The only problem with the freezer, as far as I see it, is it still has dosing in milligrams. And so you've still got this issue of being able to convert from milligrams to IU. I think that um, if a patient is on a flexible dosing regime, and so they're used to the concept of different doses at different times of the day. And maybe they have some sort of um, calculation set up that they're not trying to do the calculation ab initio every time. That They just put the number in and they get an instant readout of what that converts to in RU. I think that's probably fine. But otherwise, um, this thing about milligrams relative to RU is still a massive problem. And I'm surprised they haven't sorted it out. Yeah. Right. You'll be pleased to know that is all you need to know. So remember what we've talked about, type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We've looked at what insulin is. It's a dipeptide, remember. It's got uh, primary, secondary, um, tertiary and quaternary structures. There are a number of human analogues of insulin. Some of them are fast acting and some of them are uh, long acting. It's important to remember that the short acting insulins are designed for um, bolus injections to mimic the response from your pancreas of eating in response to eating. Whereas the long acting insulins are designed as a basal injection, so a, a background um, insulin level that once per day. Um, you might want to think about diet and how it influences type 2 diabetes in particular, especially if you're counselling a patient. If you decide that they need to go on to drug therapy, then there are, what well, the doctor decides, you're, you're prescribing. Um, there are a number of drug therapies available, but the most common thing is still to treat by giving insulin. I'm not totally convinced that's a good idea for type 2 diabetes, but it certainly is a good idea for type 1 diabetes. If a patient is on insulin, then by convention they inject, but pens are becoming a much more popular form of injection. It's still an injection, it's just it's a lot easier for the patient to control, especially if they're on a flexible dosing regimen. And then um, the next generation of devices to deliver insulin include things like um, pumps and inhalable insulins. Right, so with that, we are done. Hope that's okay. If you've got any questions, as ever, fire me an email. Otherwise, good luck in the exams, and I'll see you next year.